So uh, thank you, Dr. Gupta, for taking time out of your busy day to spend a few minutes to talk to us about the connections between oral health and cardiovascular health. Right. Um, yeah, there are. Uh, there's obviously uh, a, a definite connection between oral health and, and cardiovascular health. Uh, uh, the the primary one being that if, if your oral health is not good and you have something like uh, inflammation of your gums or, or your teeth, uh, that leads to generalized increase in inflammatory markers in your body. And those inflammatory markers can uh, increase the risk of plaque formation in your arteries or inflame your arteries and increase your risk of a heart attack. Uh, <clears throat> so that's that's the number one concern. Uh, number two concern is in patients who have pre-existing uh, heart problems. Uh, for example, if they have uh, they've had a heart valve replacement, or have had a pacemaker, or any other implanted hardware in their heart, or for that matter, anywhere else in their body, uh, if you don't take care of your dental health and you end up with uh, infections such as an, uh, you know tooth abscess or you know bad gum infection. Uh, that can become a point of entry for bacteria into your blood. And once the bacteria is in your blood, uh, the bacteria tries to latch on to any kind of hardware that's been implanted in your body. It could be a heart valve, it could be a pacemaker, it could be an artificial joint, it could be anything. <clears throat> so it becomes really important that uh, uh, if, if, if you, whether you have heart problems or not, but especially if you do have heart problems and you've had some implanted hardware, uh, that you uh, really take care of your dental health and and make routine visits with the dentist and you know be very proactive with any signs of a dental infection or uh, any any uh, ulcers in your mouth or any pain in your teeth or uh, any cracks in your teeth or any gum problems so. thank you and when would you <clears throat> recommend antibiotics prior to any dental procedure antibiotics are important for any patient who has uh, an implanted uh, cardiac hardware uh, that can include any kind of artificial heart valve, whether it be a metallic valve or a tissue valve or, uh, or if they have a pacemaker or something like that. Um, they have to take antibiotics half an hour to 45 minutes before the dental work, even if it includes just cleaning. Uh, because anytime you have any kind of uh, dental work done, uh, it's a potential for introduction of bacteria into your bloodstream. And in and, and most cases, this bacteremia or bacteria in the blood is just transient, lasting a few minutes, and your body is able to clear it without the need for antibiotics. But when you have implanted hardware, the bacteria can sometimes latch onto this artificial hardware and, and cause infections, which uh, can become life-threatening. So um, <clears throat> it doesn't apply to patients who've had only stents put in. Uh, if you have a cardiac stent for a blockage put in, that does not need antibiotics because those stents become a part of your heart uh, and are covered by your heart lining usually within a few weeks and, and it's not recommended that you take antibiotics just for stents. Um, the, there is other issues that with uh, patients who have stents, they're usually on blood thinners and um, the duration uh, of these blood thinners and the safety of being able to come off these blood thinners before dental procedures um, uh, you know, uh, varies. So. Uh, I think it's important that if, if you need to have dental work and you've had a stent implanted recently, then you really need to check with the cardiologist about the safety of coming off that blood thinner, uh, whether it be aspirin or, you know, a stronger aspirin, a different kind of, uh, you know, Plavix or something like that, or, or a real blood thinner like, you know, Warfarin or Eliquis or, you know, um, uh, uh, it, it, regardless of whatever, uh, you know, blood thinning medication you're on, uh, I think it's important to check with the cardiologist and see if you can come off it safely and for how long. Um, in most cases, if you've had the stent put in over six months ago, it's very safe to come off blood thinners for a few days and then resume them afterwards, but every case is different, so it's important to check and make sure that uh, it'd be safe to do so. And for, uh, for patients um, that have had a pacemaker, it's imperative that they know that their dental cleaning should be done with a hand scaler, not an ultrasonic scaler as well. So it's important for them to be educated as well. Going right, into true, dental. true. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, it's, it's important that you, uh, you know, if you have an implanted pacemaker or any kind of heart problems that they be disclosed to the dentist when you go to the dentist, because if, if the dentist doesn't know about it uh, uh, or, or, uh, or is not aware of it, then uh, it can lead to problems potentially. 
Um, so yeah, when you, when you do go to a dentist and if you've had heart problems, it's really important to bring those up and discuss those before any uh, dental procedures are performed. Um, quick question about the ultrasonic scalers and pacemakers. How how can an ultrasonic scaler, the use of it, impact a pacemaker? What potential so damage the, can be done? The uh, it's it's again the the. Um, well, there can be a couple of things. One, the ultrasonic scalers, uh, uh, they can cause, you know, radio interference with pacemakers sometimes. Um, uh, usually that's not the case because devices these days are pretty well shielded. Uh, but it's important that if you're using any kind of electronic device, uh, especially if you're, you know, using it close to the pacemaker, that it be evaluated for any kind of interference with the pacemaker. Um, uh, but secondly, again, the biggest risk is just, you know, uh, risk of introducing bacteria in the blood uh, with, with, with the scaling and, and the bacteria then latching onto the pacemaker leads and causing an infection. Um, the pacemaker infections are, have a high risk of morbidity and mortality uh, in that, that if the pace, any part of the pacemaker, if it gets infected, whether it's the lead or the, the generator, uh, why you know any part of it get if it gets infected the whole thing needs to come out and and that's a pretty big deal because uh, if these these pacemakers once they're put in and and after a few weeks to months uh, they they basically get uh, encased in around the heart tissue and sometimes they can be very difficult to extract uh, and need something like a laser lead extraction which you know uh, is not uh, a benign procedure so uh, again, it basically boils down to taking good dental, you know, maintaining good dental health. And if you need dental procedures to uh, make sure you take the antibiotics before the procedure. And do the same precautions apply to a, an implanted defibrillator as well? Same implanted uh, pacemaker, and defibrillator, um, uh, any kind of implanted hardware device in the heart, uh, the same principles apply. Uh, again, it doesn't apply to having uh, the cardiac stents put in for blockages. You don't need antibiotic uh, if, if it's just a stent in your heart. So, and then uh, just one question to sort of close everything out is: uh, historically, you know, dental healthcare and and medicine have been siloed and very separated. Why do you think that is, and what do you think needs to happen? in order to improve the communication and collaboration between both fields? Um, I, yeah, I do uh, uh, think that you're correct that they're, they're very separated and we don't, we don't kind of think of both as one. Uh, I think partly it has to do with our training where, you know, when you, when you go to uh, dental school, you know, uh, we don't interact much with uh, people who are, who are training in medicine and then people who go into medicine are really not interacting with people who are going to dental school. So it kind of, you forget about it until there's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for us, it's, you know, become really important because when we do heart valve replacements, um, we're, we're now proactively looking and making sure they don't have any dental problems. And if they do, we advise them to have their dental issues taken care of up front rather than after we have, you know, the hardware implanted. Uh, um, because the risk of, obviously, if you don't have the hardware implanted, there's no risk of it getting infected. But once it's implanted, you know, we really worry about, you know, these infections. So if, if you do have a plan, uh, you know, heart procedure coming up, uh, I think it becomes important to just make a check with your dentist and make sure that, you know, you don't have any dental infections or anything that can put you at risk of a, a device infection. Yeah, I agree with you. I think there's sort of a knowledge gap on both sides from that starts with medical right. dental school and right. we're kind of at an interesting time where a lot of the dentists you know we have if we see a patient with an exhaustive um, immunocompromised patient with a lot of medical conditions we send for medical clearance but right. now we're seeing healthcare systems not advise their physicians to give an actual clearance so for the patient they're there's a lot of risk involved because the dentist doesn't feel comfortable with it. But then on the other side, physicians aren't able to write off a full real clearance for that patient to proceed with right. treatment. So. Right. I think at least for cardiologists, you know, if, if for all of our patients, if they need dental work, 95% uh, of the time I would say, you know, they can go ahead and get whatever they need it done safely. There are those rare occasions where they just had the, the heart valve implanted or 
they just had a stent put in and it would not be safe to come off a blood thinner. So sometimes we'll ask them to defer it and treat whatever, you know, infection they have with antibiotics and stuff like that. Um, but in most cases, we're able to work with the dentist, I think, and at least for cardiology, we're able to work, you know, uh, establish a relationship with them where you can figure out a way to handle the problem and, and deal with it. So. And I think for some patients, there there's always an option to be seen under anesthesia with an OMFS in a hospital setting if a patient was under... Right, and that comes up too sometimes that if, is it safe to give general anesthesia to somebody with uh, uh, cardiac problems? Um, again, for most patients, it is safe as long as we're able to do an evaluation and make sure that their heart function is stable. Uh, they're able to undergo IV sedation for dental work. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Well, All thank right. you, Dr. Gupta. I really no appreciate problem. it. I think no, we learned you. a lot in a, in a short amount of time, but very beneficial information. Yeah, no, we're excited so. to have you here, Dr. Mehta. Uh, thank you All so right. much. Take care. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you.